Jim and Al were good friends and they did a great job. And then Al says, well, your backup crew is going to be Gordon, Brandon, Schmidt. Schmidt? He's a scientist. I thought, oh my goodness. Well, actually, that turned out pretty well, i got to tell you. So away we went, and the crew wasn't announced until several months later because NASA's PR campaign and the way they really let people into the loop. So we were in the loop pretty early, but Jack was in the loop before everybody. He was in a lunar module simulator full tilt before anybody knew anything about Jack Schmidt being on a backup crew. And I think it really, it really paid off. Synergism, just a little reminder. The interaction of discrete agencies, agents, or conditions such that the total effect is greater than the sum of the individual efforts. You know, and that really, really works. And it's all a matter of communications. So let me talk a little bit about how it worked and how it evolved during Apollo 15. There's our, our beginning. And uh, right after the crew was assigned, I got our training coordinator, Mike Brzezinski, and sat down and said, okay, let's look at the training plan. Because I had inputs from, I uh, had from Jack, from previous missions, and from everybody in terms of how can we really improve the training. And at that time, the commander had quite a bit of say over the training, and there had been a lot of experience prior to Apollo 15 on which we could base our decisions. So the first thing that I noticed as we uh, went through the training plan was that we were to develop and test the toilet on the command module, which took up a great portion of the uh, lower equipment bay in the command module and would have taken a great time. And we also had scheduled 14 hours of microbiology. Now, Apollo 11, 12, and 14 had returned. They'd been in quarantine, and we knew there were no bugs on the moon. So why have 14 hours? So I said, okay, let's make some changes in that. Let's increase geology training, drop the toilet, drop the 14 hours, go to one hour just so we can have the microbiology training. Uh, and then let's take a look at geology training. One of the key elements of this were field trips. We said, let's have a field trip at least once a month. And we had a great team. Uh, Jack brought in my favorite professor in all the world, Lee Silver from Caltech. And Lee was absolutely spectacular, so inspirational. I mean, he really got me fired up about going to the field and learning. Uh, and Lee's technique was different from our prior teachers, of which we had many variable teachers, who would take us to the field and say, look at this, this is that, this is basalt, this is an ortho. Lee'd take you out to the field, he said, what's that? And at first it was sort of like, I don't know, it's a rock. <laughs> well, what kind of rock? So Lee's technique was really effective. And I've got a little blue box there, Buell Pop, Arizona. That was a significant step in our evolution of science and engineering and management. When we started going into the field, I thought, you know, it'd be good for the managers and, you know, the comment, pick up rocks. It, that's true. In the early days, when I first got assigned to 15, program manager says, I want you to get out there and get back. Just bring some rocks back. Just bring a few rocks, but get home. Well, there's a lot more to it than that. So I started through the management change, inviting people out to the field. It was a lot of fun, really. I mean, instead of simulators and meetings and all that stuff, we go out somewhere for three days in the natural countryside with a bunch of really good guys and, you know, do the hills and the rocks and everything and then go to Motel 6 and drink beer and debrief. That wasn't bad. And I couldn't get anybody to go. I couldn't get the program manager. I couldn't get Dick Slate, my boss. And I worked down through the chain and I finally asked Jerry Griffin, my flight director, and his colleague, Glenn Lunny. They said, oh, yeah, we'd love to go out. So Jerry and Glenn came out to Buell Park, and Jerry will tell you he learned more about geology in one day than he had in his previous lifetime. Because they came out, they followed Lee around, and we had set up traverses. And they began to get the feel of, gee, you know, if we in management understand what the crew is doing on the moon, then we can be more effective in how we work with the crew. And by the end of our training, the last really uh, 
serious training at Coastal Hills, California, we had not only all of headquarters out there, <coughs> but half of the media as well, because they got the picture. Here's what these guys do on the moon, and if we all work together, we can help them, and they can perform better. So that was sort of a, a milestone. And there's where we really got into our, our training, myself and Jim Irwin, and we went full up. We had backpacks, we had cameras, we had radios, our Capcom was on the other side of the hill, and we'd run a full three to four hour traverse, which had been laid out, and it was an exam every time. We, the geologists, Jim had included, you know, Jim mentioned, we always liked to get him a little bit, he was a half astronaut, but Jim went out there, and he played astronaut to set up our training, and we got there, it was an exam. And Lee Silver would follow along, and we'd sit down in the evening and say, you missed that, don't miss it again, you missed it. So it was a great training program, and it was a lot of fun. One of our last trips was to the Rio Grande Gorge, and there we are on the edge. And uh, in the box, across uh, the, the gorge there, uh, you can see some layering. And we were being taught to understand how basaltic flows run out the layers and lay out something that we might see on the moon. So, among other things that happened during that period, uh, NASA management, as bold as it was in those days, decided uh, in about June of 1970 to switch missions and go to a more scientifically oriented mission. And this was after Apollo 13 and before they'd figured out what happened on Apollo 13. So after the near loss of a crew, management didn't hunker down, fall back, and slow down. Management took the step to move forward, and move forward scientifically. And you really have to admire them for that, but I think a lot of it was they understood, management by that time began to understand the value of science on the moon. Then another switch we had that was pretty interesting, uh, was going to the Hadley Apennine. There were several landing sites being considered for Apollo 15, uh, one of which was Marius Hills, another of which was Davy Rill, I mean a lot. And at some point, you have to settle down and select a site because of all the preparation necessary prior to the mission. All the trajectories had to be planned, the crew had to train in specific characteristics of that site, so it was very important to pick a site with enough time to prepare for the mission. And I remember one of the more interesting opportunities I had was another of our leaders, the program director, Rocco Patron, was ultimately responsible for determining which site we would go to. And uh, he had a big meeting in Washington, and I, was, I had no vote, but I got invited to the meeting. And there was a debate between Marius Hills and Hadley Apennine. And uh, interestingly enough, one young Beltcom geologist had written a brilliant paper on Hadley Apennine, a fellow by the name of James Head, which helped this debate quite a ways. And Rocco sat down in the morning and the room was full, headquarters, all bureaucrats, and everybody said, okay, we're going to pick a landing site today, either Marius Hills or Hadley Apennine, and nobody leaves this room until we select a site. Nobody. And they closed the doors. And so Rocco went around to this debate, and as the debate came to a conclusion, he said, hey, is Dave Scott here? I said, yes, sir. I stood up. He said, Dave, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, uh, and I'd already been pumped up pretty well. I said, Rocco, I think we can handle it. Well, the question was, to get to the Hadley Apennine, we had to change the angle of descent and landing from 12 degrees to 25 degrees. And there was a lot of concern about that being too steep, uh, getting in over the rim, over the mountains, over the Hadley Apennine Mountains. Well, Jim Irwin and I had run a lot of simulations, and we got pretty comfortable. And it was really based on an engineer who understood the importance of Hadley, a guy named Floyd Bennett, who designed a trajectory that could double the steepness and still get us down with the same amount of reserve propellant. And, and actually, <clears throat> across on the other side of the rill, uh, we named Bennett Hill. We figured if, if we got there, it was not a good thing. 
So Old Ford Bennett did a great job. Another engineer that understood the importance of what we were trying to do. And then as time went on, we had more and more inputs from our, our geology team, our science team, and one of them was, you know, uh, we'd like to put two items in your equipment for the surface. And at the time, weight was really critical. The lunar module had been upgraded, we had the rover on board, and we had a lot of this other science equipment on board, and we were down to minuscule ounces of weight allowable. And so the input I got from our team was you need a telephoto lens and then you need a rake. Well, Jack talked about the rake and I went to management, went to my boss and said, no, you can't have that. We're loaded already. Too much weight. You can't have it. Well, Jim and I had done a lot of work in a simulator, Jim Irwin, and based on uh, results from Gemini, and we forget Gemini often, all the techniques, the rendezvous techniques were developed there in Gemini. And based on the results of Gemini, we knew, and having run a lot of simulations, that we could rendezvous in less than one rev after launching from the surface of the moon, called the direct rendezvous. And if you do that, you save propellant, and you can also save abort propellant. So based on our simulations and our confidence, and even Having run all those simulations and everybody checked them, uh, they flew a direct rendezvous on 14. It took us an hour and a half. We launched on the front part of the, on the surface of the moon facing the Earth. We rendezvoused on the backside with mission control out of our hair. <laughs> but nevertheless, in looking at all that, we could trade abort propellant, which I offered to management. I said, we've run the simulations. Bill Tyndall, State of Priority, approved it. We'll trade you the abort propellant for a rake and a telephoto lens, and they bought it. So uh, that was a good deal. And there's our telephoto camera, which I'll mention briefly in a minute. Away we went uh, on the 26th of July, 1971, headed for the Adley Apennine. Uh, located, as I mentioned, in the 25 degrees north on the moon, which meant we had a nice swath that we could cover. Uh, it takes three days to get to the moon. Uh, when you get to lunar orbit, uh, we had a chance to look down at the landing site, fly over it. We spent one day in lunar orbit getting everything ready. Uh, three days on the surface, and then when we got back up, we spent two more days in lunar orbit doing orbital science. Landing in over the mountains uh, was pretty exciting, pretty spectacular. Uh, we landed just short of Hadley Rill, about a mile across and a thousand feet deep. Uh, and it was in a mountain range, which offered us some very interesting opportunities for exploration. Uh, there's Hadley Base, Jim Irwin, our flag, and Rover One, and a Lunar Module Falcon. There's yours truly and our wheels on the moon a brilliant piece of engineering. It was an electric car. I got a neighbor who's got a couple of Teslas and I tell him, I drove an electric car 45 years ago. <laughs> What's the big deal, man? <laughs> no, I didn't have any roads either. <laughs> There's our areas. We had three EVAs planned and I'll click through this quickly because I'd like to get to a little future thinking on this. There's yours truly on the side of Hadley Delta Mountain. 18 degrees inclination, and the rover pulled it right up, just like you hardly knew we were going up, but it was very difficult to work in the soft material. And after EVA-1, driving home, why we spent a little bit more time on the side of the mountain than, than we should have, as we always do. And mission control would keep telling us, you know, you're running out of time, get back, get back. And it's not because mission control is controlling that. We let them keep track of our metabolic rate and our consumption, our usage of oxygen and water. So they become our clock watcher for us. And they make sure that we have enough uh, oxygen and water to either walk back if the rover breaks or drive back if one guy has a backpack failure. And we even had a little uh, buddy sliss that we could connect one backpack to another like scuba divers do. 
So they would hurry us along, and Jim and I were having really a great time. I mean, it's just really, we were having fun out in the field, I'll tell you. And they said, no, no more geology, get home, get back. We gotta close out, we gotta get the OSAP out. Hurry up, you guys, get back. So we're driving back, and uh, I look over, and out there in a very light, bright surface was a black rock. I mean, solid black, just like Jim had had put it there. <laughs> testing me again. He's always testing me. Solid. I thought, boy, I, I got, I got to have that baby. So I nudged Jim. We always had these little signals, and he starts talking eloquently about the local setting geologically, and just gibbering and jabbering, oh, in good terms. And I stopped the rover and I said, Hey, Houston, uh, I got a seatbelt problem. Now you have to have seatbelts on the moon because otherwise you'll bounce out of the rover. That one six G. And we'd had problems with our seat belts. One of the things we didn't anticipate was we tested them on the Earth, and they fit just fine. But on the Earth, you have one G, and the suit compresses enough so the seat belts were too tight when we got to the moon. So we we're having problems. And they said, OK, well, you can stop and fix the seat belt, but hurry up. So I stopped and unhooked my seat belt, and my suit got off of the rover. And my suit walked over to this rock. <laughs> and, and, and my tongs got stuck in the ground, and my camera went off to take a picture. And I thought, well, since I'm here, I'll pick it up. And I picked it up, put it in my pocket, and headed back to the rover, hopped on the rover, hooked up my seat belt. I said, okay, mission control, we're on our way back. Okay, hurry up. It took me a minute and 47 seconds. And I had this jewel, and they didn't know about it. So. <laughs> That's okay, because I had something that turned out to be really quite special. It was a dark black vesicular basalt, and, and the tongs are there as, as scale. And it was just the contrast between, it had no dust on it, the contrast between the rock and the surface was dramatic. And so they called it the seatbelt basalt. <laughs> and uh, this on the right there, vesicular olive. It was, it was quite a nice sample, and uh, it was another part of yeah, it's a challenge on the moon, but it was a lot of fun, and we had a good time. Now we had, as I mentioned, three traverses, and perhaps one of the most significant legs on a traverse is down in the bottom right at Sewer Crater uh, on EVA-2. Uh, we found another sample, with which I'm sure you're familiar. Uh, we got the Spur Crater, which was an optional crater, by the way. Uh, when we went by it, we saw it and said, in our little checklist, optional, if you have time, well, we stopped at that one. We spent 45 minutes, 43 minutes, and we could see a unique sample. One of the things that Lee taught us was to collect a, a, a sweep of rocks, pick up like a dozen rocks, pick up like 10 to ten, tell the normal situation, and a couple of unusual rocks. And we looked around, and Jim Rue and I saw this at the same time, and we said, that's the one. And we could see, even under the dust, we could see the twinning in the pledge. So we went over and picked it up, and uh, the media called it the Genesis Rock. It was pretty old at the time. It wasn't the oldest rock from the moon, but it was a dandy. And it was just brilliant in that sunlight. Some people say that on the moon it's difficult because of the bright sun to recognize rocks, and that's wrong. It's just spectacular when you get the differentiation of the types of rocks you see in the shadows. Boy, it just sparkles. So then we went on our third EVA uh, to Hadley Rill. Took my camera. You know, we had taken a lot of pictures. We had actually three cameras, two standard Hasselblads and one with a telephoto lens. And uh, there's yours truly hopping off the rover and heading to Hadley Rill. Lo and behold, layering, just like Taos, New Mexico. Uh, this is taken with a 500 millimeter lens, and the layers are about 20 meters thick, and this like 330 meter uh, real depth. And there we were, we're homeward bound after 12 days. Uh, we had three days in the surface, three days in orbit, six days to and from, had 170 pounds of rocks and soil, and we took 1,100 photographs on the surface of the moon, which is often overlooked. And if anybody uh, has an inkling to go do some more analysis, as Jack pointed out, many of these photos have not been analyzed, and there are some very, very interesting things. 
uh, objects, rectangular rocks, and uh, layers that haven't been analyzed. And we tried to take pictures of everything we thought would be significant, and we had a lot of them. So now let me step into new opportunities for science engineering synergy, and there are some really spectacular opportunities. Let me call this Optimum Apollo. If we take the basic Apollo architecture and operations and use contemporary technology to improve the lunar module, well, one of the interesting exercises going on at this time is Jim Head is working with Professor Jeff Hoffman at MIT to uh, <coughs> teach students science engineering synergism in that get the students at MIT interested in science and get the students at Brown interested in engineering and cross-train. So Jeff Hoffman last year had a course in Lean Lunar Return, he called, and a couple of young men, uh, Alan, Austin Nichols and Alec Buck, made a presentation last year about their uh, human architecture for lunar operations they call HALO. And what they did in class was to uh, take the lunar module as we know it and say, okay, let's improve it with technology. They changed the propellant the descent stage, changed some of the structure, uh, updated electronics, replaced batteries, and the result was 44% in reduction of overall lunar module mass. That's a lot which means you can carry 44% more science equipment for the same architecture, the same launching. Uh, the next thing we're looking at is a lunar rover roving vehicle, and Jeff Hoffman has a class this semester in which you're looking at the LRV. How can you improve the LRV? Well, one thing you can do is a high capacity battery. Another thing you can do is carry two additional backpacks to double the time that the crew can spend outside on the surface, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And we have these high resolution photos from LROC now for traverse planning. When we went to Hadley, the best photos were 40 meter resolution. 40 meters was the best we could see. And now you're looking at these little pixels. I mean, you look at a little teeny thing. So in traverse planning, the technology we have today, like LROC, enables us to take a much closer look at the surface and very carefully plan the traverse, which gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot more range. And instead of a large launch vehicle, we don't need that anymore. We use multiple commercial launch vehicles because we know how to rendezvous. Before Apollo, when they built the Saturn V, we didn't know if we could rendezvous. So everything had to be launched in the Earth orbit on one package. Today, Rendezvous, we know, is a walk in the park. Everybody does it. It's easy to do. So we can go buy three Delta IVs or Atlas Vs or whatever, and we can put the same mass in Earth orbit, assemble it in Earth orbit, and go to the moon. So this additional capability enables us to use existing Apollo architecture and techniques with new technology and really do some uh, extraordinary work. If we look at the results of HALO by uh, Austin and Alex, on Apollo 15, 16, and 17, we had a crew of two, three days on the surface, one rover, equatorial landing, 100 kilograms roughly to bring back, and, and their enhanced lunar mission when they scrub the limb down, you can take three crew, you can stay seven days, two rovers, 100% coverage on the moon, and bring back 350 kilograms. So a dramatic increase in science capability, which I'll apply to a few examples for you. Now, a baseline mission with this capability, we can stay seven days. Three crew members, they can rotate two EVA days each, and Jack even mentioned that uh, the third crew member can do some analysis while the other two are outside on subsequent days. Max range traverses, I look at this as, as finding a little region in the landing area of specific importance and sending the crew straight out there, no stops unless you find a seat built basalt somewhere, no stops, get to your target, and you can spend three hours out there. 
in three hours at one place, Jack had 30 minutes at one of his best plays, we had 43 minutes. Man, three hours, if I could have had three hours at Spur Crater, man, you wouldn't have had enough capacity in the lunar module to bring it back. I mean, it's just a great opportunity. Limitations, keep the crew down to eight hours. Uh, rover range, 15 kilometers max. There are two reasons you can do that. Jack mentioned one. Reduce the constraints of seven kilometers out for walk back, but you carry an extra backpack with you, so you can essentially double that. So that means I can take a straight shot 15 kilometers away from the landing point and spend three hours at a station. I mean, that is just something that you can hardly wait to try. And again, this is just using Apollo stuff. Nothing new, but some lessons learned and some new technology. So I'll give you three quick examples. We'll go back to Hadley and have a look at expanded Hadley. Try Aristarchus, Copernicus, and uh, Tsiolkovsky, which I'll go back and look there. My favorites. These are not the highest on the list of landing sites, but I'll tell you, when you fly over them and look down, you say, I gotta go there, because that's where it's at. So let's take a, a quick look at how we would use our new technology uh, at the Hadley Apennine. So we call it Hadley Expanded, we go to the area in the light green. Uh, if you compare our area, uh, Apollo 15, and go to Expanded Hadley, and if you take the, the idea of a 15, col uh, 15 kilometer straight shot to a target as maximum, you can actually look at three so or six sites at Hadley of significance on one mission. Uh, we had 46 minutes and again three hours at each stop. And if you take some objectives, and I have the benefit of Jim Head, I'll tell you, it's really fun to work with Jim because I can email him or, or go back to Brown or whatever and say, what would we do now? So if you look in the upper left, there are some six specific targets and six specific things to learn at an expanded Hadley, which is a template for the other places, meaning that I'll show you three other landing sites and what we could do there quickly, uh, and I'll leave the specifics up as an exercise for the student. Just let your mind wander and use your imagination, because it could be some spectacular missions. Try Copernicus, you know? We all like that one. Uh, <coughs> spectacular that photo that Carly showed earlier, the photo of the century. Uh, it is again a spectacular crater, 95 kilometers across, uh, with Central Peak. And here, if you start left, right at the top and come down, some of the boulders near the Central Peak are just like uh, the one Jack had on Apollo 17. 17. They're enormous boulders. And there's a great opportunity. Uh, area of exploration at Copernicus, within that dash box, using the template we had at Expanded Hadley. Uh, I mean, you could, and this is only a template, there are a lot of other ways to do this, but you can really cover, you can cover the inside of the wall, you can cover the peaks, you can cover the, the floor, the basin, the regolith. Uh, I mean, again, could be a spectacular mission. Try Aristarchus. Boy, that's one of the most spectacular views you ever get from Earth or from lunar orbit. And the photos don't do it justice. Uh, the crater itself, Aristarchus, on the plateau and to the lower right as a cobra head, is white. When you go over the right lighting, it's white against the dark, light gray background. And it is a scene, and it's a place, a place to go. 40 kilometers, you notice that it's about half the diameter of Copernicus, again, with a very nice central peak and an area that we would see as an op opportunity for exploration is between the central peak and the inside of the rim. Uh, if you put our template there and say, okay, this, this is the kind of traverses we can set up. Uh, you can pick up the peak, you can pick up the inside of the rim and the floor, uh, and you can arrange these traverses in any direction at any time because we say, we can go 15 kilometers on one day and spend three hours at one major site. So it really gives you some flexibility. Try Tsiolkovsky, again, 
flying over that, and Jack will tell you this too, that is just another scene that's hard to believe. On the far side of the moon, uh, the largest dark spot and the only major crater on the far side of the moon, it's huge, 190 kilometers across, and the black pool on the inside is stunning, absolutely stunning. And it means there's a lot there. Uh, let's pick one place to explore. Uh, notably, the central peak is three kilometers high, and there are many areas of Tsiolkovsky of interest, but again, as an example, I'll toss the template in there, uh, look at that central peak, and the areas that we could explore and what we could learn from Seals Coffee on one mission. So as a little quick summary here, uh, I picked four places for Optimum Apollo. Uh, and to remind you, with some science engineering synergism, basic Apollo architecture and operations, contemporary technology using HALO, 44% reduction in, in limb mass, uh, improve the lunar rolling vehicle, multiple launch vehicles, and you can go back to the moon with a, Apollo, optimized by using today's technology. And I always like to have one final look. I show this to people when I do my little talks, and they say, oh, look, the moon. That's right. The moon's in the foreground. <laughs> that crescent up there happens to be the Earth. And when we're on Apollo 15, our last rev around the moon, we took pictures of the Earth because of the phasing of the sun and the moon, the Earth was a crescent. But as you get closer back to the Earth, you get the big picture. And uh, this is actually, I think, the best picture taken of the Earth, and it was taken by Apollo 17. We didn't have a very good uh, trajectory to get such a picture, but it's a beautiful place, and the reason we go to the moon is to learn about the Earth, as you all know. We have to learn about the Earth, we have to understand it and the resources, and we have to keep it healthy. That's the objective. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and take any questions. And the first question will be from Lunar Module Pilot Harrison H. I, 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 really, I really wanted to add a few names to the mix of people that were really uh, enablers for the training of, the, uh, of all the missions, as a matter of fact, and particularly the J missions. Uh, and that, uh, Gordon Swan uh, was your PI, uh, Bill Muller was mine, and, and between the two of them on the many missions, they provided the logistic glue that made the training possible. Uh, it put together the, uh, the trips, uh, the logistics, the traverse planning of the uh, the individual simulation trips and things like that. Uh, and of course, uh, early on, uh, Gene Shoemaker was a great inspiration. Everybody it was unfortunate he became disillusioned uh, early on, but uh, not, nonetheless, uh, uh, without those three people, uh, things would have been quite a bit different. We couldn't have done it all without that, uh, that team that they put together. Uh, just to add to that, I think, you know, in a couple of the slides you saw, Apollo uh, lunar field geology experiment. So there were a lot of scientific experiments, uh, gravimeters and all sorts of things like this. And so the question was, what do you do with geology, okay? Well, this experiment was designed to actually do the geology. And Gene Shoemaker, uh, Gordon Swan, and Bill Mulberg were the principal investigator. And as Jack pointed out, they were really instrumental in organizing and implementing this. Huge amounts of the training and, and really uh, we owe them a huge debt the success of that experiment, okay? I might add one comment to follow Jack up. You know, Senator Schmidt is a diplomat. Uh, I could never make the grade. Robot assistance, no, absolutely not. Jack needs to be convinced, but he's, he's, he will be. You know, there's a lot of talk about robot assistance. There are three things along with that. One of which is it takes time away from the geologist on the moon, you know? The second is, if it breaks, you have to fix it, right? And if you have to fix it, you have to take some parts with you with which to fix it. And which parts do you take? We never had enough uh, weight anyway, and we had to fight to get the rake and, and the lens. Taking a robot assistant takes away from all the other science 
And then finally, if you have a robot assistant, it's another thing you have to learn. And I can assure you, the challenge, learning how to go to the moon and explore the moon, there's so many things you have to learn, so many systems, that to try to learn one other thing that's going to take time away from your geology, I just think that isn't going to happen, I hope. But I endorse Jack's comments. And I think one of the things we've been doing in, our, uh, in conjunction with our studies with MIT is, is looking at human robotic synergism, not just as a field assistant, but how do you complement and supplement, interpolate and extrapolate using robotics. And there's huge things you can do. For example, getting down in the rill is not trivial, obviously, but uh, there are these hoppers at MIT uh, students have designed which can actually be deployed and sample all the way up and down the rail. So there's lots of complementarity which can be controlled from the Earth, not by the astronauts, for the very reasons that Jack and Dave uh, mentioned. Uh, let me just point one other thing here. A lot of people um, might not be, Dave is a very understated guy, okay? So you probably don't understand maybe what he means when he says, we traded off a board propellant for the rake and the 500 millimeter lens. Okay, what does that mean? That means um, that when you land on the moon, you actually fly looking up. You flip over, and it's the proverbial moment of truth. Uh, you first see where you're heading, okay? And uh, quite often in simulations, the simulation supervisors would make you go into a crater, so you immediately knew that you could not land, and you had to push, open the little door, push the big red button, and you were launched. The ascent stage was immediately launched on a trajectory that nobody had a clue where it was going. <laughs> just somewhere. So, you know, from my point of view, that's when I'd like to kind of optimize the amount of a board per I <laughs> Because we had a run, of, you're, you're looking at the sextant, you're getting at the star charts, you're trying to figure out where the hell you are, okay? So you can rendezvous with a lunar module and get back, with a command module and get back home. So Dave, in this understated way, is trading off a board propellant for science. Just wanted to tell you. <laughs> Pam yeah, Clark, um, Dave. Um, you know, I did a, we did some similar studies in 2008-2009, which appeared in the GSA Bulletin special issue on um, analog studies. And we used enhanced architecture. We actually used three levels of architecture. Apollo was baseline. And we came to the conclusion, we looked at Marius Hills in particular, and as well as Lukowski. And we, we liked the idea of more stations. About the same amount of time, but, we, but there's so much, in, in places where there's a lot of stuff going on nearby, um, that might be another strategy. I would like to, to comment on that. Yeah, I, I, I picked the, the straight shot to one station for uh, a reason based on my experience because uh, our best station was Spur Crater because it happened to be an option, but when we saw it, we knew it was something special, and there was more and more there. And once you get off the rover, and you set the rover up, and the TV and everything is going, then you don't have any more overhead. You can charge on and do field geology and take advantage of the human capabilities and all the surprises you get in the field. Uh, every time you stop the rover, then you have to go through a procedure it essentially turns it off and checks the systems and set up the antenna and all that, which is overhead. So my, my preference would be go straight shot to some station. Now, you don't have to go 15 kilometers. I'm just saying that's how far you could go. You can go seven kilometers and you can spend more than three hours in one place. Or you can stop at a number of stations. And that depends on the, the local area. But uh, I, I favor minimizing overhead whenever you can. Well, Yes, yeah, a question for, for Jim, Jack, and Dave. Um, we've heard about optimizing uh, the Apollo scenario to do more science on the moon, but how do we actually get back to the moon when we've got a been there, done that mentality right now? I mean, how, how do we actually facilitate uh, human exploration beyond, beyond low Earth orbit? How do we get back to the moon? It's education. You know, we have to educate the public uh, and NASA, and the administration. And we have to find a reason, which is the real challenge. And again, I thank Sasha for his uh, very informative presentation. The reason we got to the moon was because there was competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. And the Soviet Union started the competition. 
and we finally catch, caught up. But uh, it, was a, it was a great race, and it produced the capability for humans to explore the moon. And I don't know whether that ever would have happened without that competition. That was a reason to go. So we broke the barrier in terms of being able to do that. Now we know we can do it. And the next step is, uh, in my view, go back to the moon. There's so much to learn, but we know how to do that. And the cost of going back to the moon is far less than capturing an asteroid, I guarantee you that. Because that's a very difficult chore. And when you capture the asteroid, according to the current plan, uh, last year I looked at NASA's favorite asteroid, and amongst all the other things we heard yesterday about uh, human exploring asteroids, why uh, NASA's favorite asteroid, if we explored the entire surface area, it would not be as much as the surface we covered on Apollo 15. And there wouldn't be any stops either. So it's, you know, again, in my view, education. You have to get out there and you have to teach. And I guess what Jim and I are trying to do is teach the young people, teach the people who are going to be managers in 10 or 20 years, the value and the importance of going back to the moon. But uh, the word doesn't get to the public and they just don't get it and neither does the administration. So, and I'm not sure exactly the answer except that it's going to be hard work, but we need to do it. I just add to that that I think, uh, you know, another important thing is to learn from the past, which is what we've been talking about today. I think that one of the major problems with conservation, uh, this is a personal view, had it not been canceled, it still needed a brain transplant because you basically started with the idea that we just do everything and forget the science. And uh, that changed with time a little bit, but it wasn't a bottoms up kind of thing. These students are starting with, you know, you can just see the light bulb go up. Let's see, challenge, go to the moon. What, wait a minute, we've done that. Uh, uh, it worked. Uh, okay, now let's start with that. Take 45 years of technology and figure out what you can do. That's why it's not as expensive as constellation at all. Okay, so that's something we need to think about too. Let's start from the bottom up and, and work on that. Problem. Jack, did you have a comment to add? Well, we can argue about whether constellation had a science component. It, it did, primarily coming out of the Science Advisory Council. But. Uh, the, uh, the essential ingredient for any future program is going to have a sufficient management reserve to deal with unknown unknowns. If you do get a program authorized, you've got to have that management reserve. Apollo had 100% management reserve, thanks to Jim Webb, uh, doubling what the engineers said it was going to cost. And, uh, and, to, and keeping with that with the Congress, and the Congress was willing to go along with it. That's for the first landing. The, uh, uh, but with it, you know, that is absolutely, from a program management point of view, if you have an insufficient management reserve, you're going to delay schedule, and ultimately, in the case of Constellation, which lost, not only did, well, it had a management reserve to begin with, but was never funded adequately by out of the OMB, uh, you would have had a Constellation program, and I think a very good one, had it been properly funded. By the time it was canceled, it was over $11 billion underfunded, and, uh, and that schedule was being slipped in order to to meet milestones. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there's some real complications that once you get a program started, uh, the only way to sustain it is with, and, and keep it on the schedule is, uh, is with a management reserve. Now, how do you get a program started uh, today? I don't know. I mean, the competition is there. It's clear what uh, the Chinese are, are have in mind, and, uh, but uh, I don't see any reaction yet uh, in order to get it started for that reason. And I'm not sure that we in this room can get it started any other way. Take your other one. Hi, Dave. I appreciated hearing about the illumination samples on the surface. And uh, would love to hear more about it. I, could you see colors very well? And did you find yourself optimizing for sun angle or for slopes? And did it change very much during, your, during the time you were there? Well, actually, on the surface, uh, it's so clear and so crisp, and when you're looking for things and uh, you know what you're looking for, it, it sort of jumps out at you in a, in a sense. In that, uh, as I mentioned, the anorthosite uh, was covered with dust, but we could still see it was something unique and unusual. We picked it up and had a good look at it. Uh, and it's so definitive. The eye is so much better than the camera, and we, you know, we documented all the samples with photographs. They, don't, they just don't do it. And I've played around with even 
uh, PowerPoint has some interesting lighting correction capabilities in it and artistic capabilities in it. And I fooled around a little bit to see if I could get a picture of what I actually saw on the moon as opposed to what the photographs show you now. And you can see some, by shadowing and things, you can see some, some dramatic changes. And I'll tell you, when you're on the surface, Jack will tell you this too. I mean, it's just spectacular. There's so much def definition and clarity. And it's, it, at the same time, you're zoning. You know, you're spiked up about finding this stuff. And if you've had the proper training, why, uh, it all jumps out at you. Uh, and, and I hit the green rock as an example. You know, we were, Jim Rowan and I were pretty proud of our terminology, basalts and breaches and anorthosites and all that stuff, and we had professors standing by in mission control, and we were trying to show, you know, how smart we were, and we did find one rock and picked it up, and we used to take turns calling it, you know, so we'd get an A for each of us, and I picked it up, I said, hey, Jim, I think it's your turn. I gave it to him. And she said, oh, 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 no, Dave, you lost track. It's your turn. It's Jim. Oh, God. So we struggled with that, and we finally called it a green rock. Jeez, you know, can you imagine Jim Head and Lee Silver and Gordon Swan sitting there? What do you mean these guys found a green rock? What are they talking about? You know, what, what are they drinking? Kool-Aid? And it was green, and it was hard to tell because nobody had ever seen color on the moon before. So our brain was set to gray. And it really, and by golly, we got back, it was. And we're in a lunar receiving lab going down the row of rocks, and we got back checking them, and the professor was standing behind us, and boy, the basalt and the bretchen, and the and came to this one container, and I thought, well, I'll move by this one quickly. And Lee Silver said, wait, don't you want to know what that is? I thought, oh, God, flunked again. <laughs> I said, we've been looking at that for almost three days. The best we can come up with is a friable green clod. <laughs> and, it, and, and it was this volcanic material, half glass and half soil, little millimeter spirits. Jack found the orange, and they have water in them. So that was part of being able to see on the moon something that was unusual and didn't fit, and being a human, knowing, having been taught, pick up the unusual, even if it doesn't fit. So we picked up the unusual, and uh, it's just a, a great experience, and I think, uh, matter of fact, we've been talking to the new classes of astronauts, the last two classes, Jack and Jim and I, trying to get them sort of uh, interested. They are very interested. Their chance of going to the moon is sort of tough right now, but get them out there and help them, help them explain to the public, explain to Congress uh, the value of doing this, and then perhaps they'll be the managers making the decisions down the road. And again, to emphasize that the science and engineering synergies of Dean Effort here at Johnson Space Center uh, is in fact really instrumental in the geological training program. So there is a full-scale geological training program headed up by Dean, and it's, it's really quite amazing. Jack? I just uh, reminded me, uh, Dave said, reminded me of the importance of having managers who are uh, not only sympathetic, but smart and knowledgeable. Uh, we talk about the uh, the block, essentially a block two lunar module that uh, Dave flew on Apollo 15. The development of that actually began in 1969 before Apollo 11 as a result of the decision George Lowe made. And George uh, early on realized that if we were successful in uh, meeting uh, Kennedy's challenge, that we would could be successful in doing a lot of other things. And I think our biggest friend in uh, near senior management for that period of time was George Lowe. Uh, you also may not be aware that, that uh, for Apollo 11, the field geology experiment was thrown off. It was, the outset was thrown off for, for weight reasons and uh, hover time. The outset uh, in which the field geology experiment was sort of included uh, was heavy enough to give us three more seconds of heavy jobs hover time. And, and at the time, that was considered very important. And, uh, and, but having thrown off the field geology experiment, Lowell was willing to have Gene Shoemaker as sort of an advisor in order to have something that ended up being an outstanding collection because of Neil's intelligence and, and enthusiasm, an outstanding collection of, of rocks and the deployment of a, of a, a couple of experiments that uh, my uh, geophysical friends around the country uh, said were 
two experiments that ought to be on the moon if we never went back, and that was the corner reflector and a seism seismometer. Uh, and so that's how that's how that all started. But having somebody in, uh, uh, and and more than one, but but Lowell, George Lowell really deserves an awful lot of credit for enabling much of what uh, we've been talking about. I couldn't agree more with that. And George. Amazing guy, you know, when you went to a meeting in his office, uh, there were no chairs. And commonly, you, you would just stand there until a decision was made. I mean, you know, we're launching next week. You had no time to sit down. And really an incredible guy. Uh, now, if you don't mind, I know a little anecdote about George Lowe. <clears throat> and Sasha sort of led into this. In uh, early 1968, why the race was on, uh, we'd had our problems. Uh, the Soviets had had their problems, but they put a couple of zones, three of them around the moon, in, uh, I think, zone five in November, brought back a photo of Earthrise. It was a grainy black and white photo, but they were making great progress. And we were struggling. Uh, Apollo 7 hadn't gone yet. Uh, the lunar module, which we got to fly on Apollo 9 later on, was having really tough time, it just wouldn't check out, it just wasn't working. And it looked like we weren't going to get anything off until sometime in 1969. And I know we can look back now, George Lowe knew that the Soviets were making great progress. In fact, in early December, if you recall, Apollo 7 went in October, it had to be 100% successful. Uh, and then what was the next step? And George said, let's not wait for the limb, let's go around the moon before the end of the year. And, and we did on Apollo 8. At the same time, the Soviets were making great progress. And as I understand it from Alexei Leonov, I like to talk to Sasha about it sometime, uh, we know that they had a launch window in early December. We went in late December. The Soviets had a launch window in early December. They had a manned spacecraft on the pad it could have done a circum circumlunar, a zone, another zone, and they didn't go because I guess it was mission decided they needed one more test flight before they put humans on it. And a group of cosmonauts went to the bosses saying, we'll fly it, let's go. And it was close because George Lowe called it and said, let's put somebody around the moon quickly. And that was another very, very bold step. But it won the race. And I see Jack the other. Jack got some comments on that one too. But that was a good one. Yeah, it's just a little uh, additional history on that. If you go back into the time of the uh, Space Task Group that uh, was uh, working at Langley under Gilroo's direction, uh, back in, uh, it would be, uh, it really started in the pre NASA days and, and continued into the early NASA, uh, 58 and subsequent. Lowell was part of the space task group, although he was working out of headquarters. And one of the things that he did was conducted a study on, circum, on a, a circumlunar or lunar orbit mission with just one spacecraft. And this was in the, it, literally uh, before 1960 uh, when he thought that through. And so when, it, when they ran into the problems of schedule on the lunar module, uh, and actually there was a Saturn V issue at the same time, uh, Lowell was very comfortable already with putting a, a mission in orbit around the, around the moon. So these, this, it's amazing how these blocks, these little blocks sort of all come together. And I might add one thing uh, to that, uh, and why Apollo 11 landed where it did. Uh, Apollo 8 had, was a very successful mission. The crew from 60 nautical miles had a good look at the first of the Apollo, uh, potential Apollo sites in the east, and felt very comfortable with what they saw, even though from 60 nautical miles, I guess they had a monocular on board, 10 power, and, uh, and came back and said, yeah, that looks like it's a place where we can land. Well, with that, uh, Tom Stafford and I started talking and said, well, the next mission up to the moon was Apollo 10. I said, well, why don't we target Apollo 10 to the next Apollo site, get comfortable with that, and then because Apollo 10 was going to be longer, we would see a third site. Well, <clears throat> Finally, uh, Lowell and Phillips decided that, yeah, that was probably a good idea, even though it, it meant a lot of work for mission planning and analysis to pull together another big, big uh, data pack for uh, a different site. And, and because the Apollo 10 mission uh, looked at tranquility uh, 
and had a data back to Frank Crowley, there was no question that that's where Apollo 11 was going to go. Uh, so that's one site selection that I don't think Jim had, had much to do with. <laughs> exactly. Well, I really want to thank Jack Schmidt and Dave Scott for incredible talks and just sharing uh, the excitement and the visionary exploration of the moon with Apollo. Thank you.